Good evening. Welcome back. Hey, we've only met one time in the last month for our birthday study, but we're going to finish strong. We got tonight and two more weeks to go. Uh, in the future, we want to make sure we co we cover a couple of things, especially the day of, and the year of redemption. We want to make sure we cover the feast days. Um, we want to try to cover uh, leprosy. See, we're already out. We're already out of room, so we're getting uh, what we can. Now, as for tonight, we have a guest speaker. And so, I, and, and so our guest speaker tonight is a graduate of Stephenville High School. He uh, went on to study at Dallas Baptist University. Before he graduated from there, he was a music leader at Deliverance Bible Church in Dallas, Texas. Uh, as soon as he graduated, went off to someplace in Southeast Asia, Nepal. Was in Nepal for over a year and just got back. And he is the newest active student at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's accepted the letter, and he starts on January the 17th working on a, a mass, MDiv, Master yeah. of Divinity. Yeah, trying, yeah. yeah. Trying to get it right. So we're going to send him to North Carolina with a lot of money. And so... <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of money. And so... Um, is that a Gideon Bible you're about to teach out of? Yeah. Oh, so Matthew Tarpley is here with a, a Gideon Bible, and he's going to teach our Leviticus lesson tonight. Matt, come on up. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, I'm so excited to share the word tonight. Uh, please open your Bibles with me to the book of Leviticus. We're going to be in chapter 16 tonight. Leviticus chapter 16. I was still in Nepal whenever uh, I was watching the live streams, whenever my dad started doing this Bible study. And so it's, it's just kind of exciting for me. It's very humbling. It's a privilege for me to share this word tonight because I was watching these live streams on the other side of the planet whenever we started, whenever you all started this study. And so I would have never thought when I was over there that I was going to be giving one of the messages tonight. So I'm so excited. Today we're in Leviticus 16. We're going to be talking about the Day of Atonement on the Hebrew calendar, that's the day of Yom Kippur. And I have seven cross-reference scriptures. So I need seven people to raise your hand and to take these texts, okay? I got one. Okay, okay. Mom, I need you to take uh, Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. 14 through 16. So just kind of have it ready. Right here. Okay. Hebrews 5, 1 through 5. Okay. Miss Babe. Let's do Hebrews 7, 25 through 27. And over there, we got Romans 3, 23 through 25. Okay. And I got two more. No, three more. Three more. Right here, we got Romans 5, seven, uh, 8 through 9. Right here. Let's do Psalm 103, 10 through 12. And last one, let's do 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Yes, ma'am. Don't tell me. Where Tim starts, I know 103 by memory. Okay. <laughs> you know that whole song by memory? Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Was, I'm sorry. I thought it was mine. It was Hebrews. Uh, um, I believe it was 7, 25 through okay. 27. Does anyone else have that one? <laughs> okay. We're going to do a lot of Bible tonight, okay? I hope that's okay with you. Fine by me. So, Day of Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement on the Hebrew calendar, and even today in Rabbinic Judaism, they will still, uh, even secular and Orthodox Jews, they'll go into synagogues, and they will spend a 24-hour period inside the synagogue seeking to make an atonement for their sins. Uh, they'll fast for the entire day. They'll write out all the sins that they can remember. They'll make resolutions for the year to come. It's, a, it's one day a year when atonement is finally made. Uh, for the nation of Israel. And if there's one thing that I hope you've learned so far in this Bible study that my father's been leading, is that the Bible's not about you. It's not about me. The Bible is about Jesus. Amen. Right? The, the essence of the Old Testament is, the, is a foreshadowing of Christ, of the cross, of the finished work. Uh, Jesus talked about that in the book of Luke, chapter 24, on the road to Emmaus, whenever the two disciples are with him. It says that he opened their eyes to comprehend the scriptures. And it says that he went through all the scriptures and showed him himself from the Old Testament. He, he, he said a similar thing to the Pharisees. He says, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have life, but they testify of me. The Bible is about Jesus one of the clearest pictures of Christ is in the book of Leviticus, but one of the clearest pictures of Christ in this book is in chapter 16 on the Day of Atonement. 
God has prescribed a means of accomplishing the redemption of his elect, of those that he's called out of the world and intends to glorify him by demonstrating his grace, his mercy, his love. God has a prescribed means of doing that. And before we get in to uh, the, the entire chapter of 16, I want us to look at verse 1 right here. Um, it says, Leviticus 16, verse 1, it says, The Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. Does anybody know who the two sons of Aaron were? Phineas <laughs> and what was the other one? That, that was that was Eli, Eli's sons. Oh, the Eli's sons. Yeah, okay. they they were also really bad sons. guys. <laughs> Nadab and Abihu. Oh, yeah. Nadab and Abihu. Okay. It says when they offered before the Lord and died. Nadab and Abihu, in Leviticus chapter ten, uh, they offered what the Scripture calls strange fire upon the altar of God. God has a prescribed means of making uh, reconciliation. Right, of making atonement. Nadab and Abihu, we don't know necessarily what they offered on the altar, but, but it's, it's safe to say that God said, I want you to take this incense, this, this fire, and offer it in this way. They offered a different type of fire. They offered it not in the prescribed means. And it says that that offering consumed them. Whenever you go outside of the way that God has ordained for us to come to him, it doesn't work in the end. A lot of people, especially in my generation, we want to reinvent Christianity. We, we take a lot of the most foundation, the foundational doctrines that make us Christians, the divinity of Jesus, imputed righteousness, substitutionary atonement, and we say, eh, that was, that was for generations past. We don't really like that doctrine. We don't like having to say we have to have the righteousness of another. We don't really like all the blood and the sacrifices and faith and all this stuff. We don't like a God who has, he says that there's only one way of salvation. And so we try to reinvent the real wheel quite a bit. And it's false doctrine. It's false teachers who do these things. False doctrine in the church of Christ is strange fire upon the altar of God. And it doesn't work. In verse 1, you see man's way. And, 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 and God has a prescribed way of making atonement. And that's what we find in Leviticus chapter 16. We're not going to read the whole chapter, but we're going to deal with three major sections. In, in this chapter, we see the role of Aaron as a high priest and two goats, two offerings. One priest and two offerings. And I would like to submit to you that Christ is the essence of the priesthood and Christ is what is foreshadowed. He is the image of what is only seen in types and shadows from these two offerings. So let's get right into it really quick. Uh, I'm going to read verses 2 through 5. And um, you guys be ready with your scriptures because we're going we're gonna to be jumping around quite a bit. Okay, So verse 2, it says, The Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with a linen girdle. And with the linen mitre shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kid goats for a sin offering, and one ram for a burnt offering. I'm going to read verse 6 as well. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for himself. Right here you have the work of the high priest. God chose one man from among the nation of Israel to be a representation, a representative for the nation because he's one of them. He, he knows what it's like to be a part of that nation. He knows what it's like to come out uh, of their culture, of their family. He feels their temptations. He's, he, he's been a part of the nation and their own sins. And God chose one man out of that nation to wear sacred uh, clothing to go into the sacred place 
to offer safe, sacred ordinances before God so that God could be reconciled to his people. That they could be his people. He could be their God. God has established a priesthood. God has established a priesthood. And I want to submit to us tonight that Christ is our high priest that God has set aside for us. Who has Hebrews chapter 5, 1 through 5? Hebrews chapter 5. Did you guys... You guys get that one? That's our first scripture for the night. Oh, I thought you told me four. Well, I can read I, it. I had three, three, chap three uh, passages from <laughs> Hebrews. I can no. read that if you want me to. Or yeah, go for it, Mom. Take it. Okay. Hebrews 5, 1 through 5. 5, 1 through 5. For every high priest taken from among men is ordain ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassioned with infirmity? And by reason thereof, he ought, as the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto, unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. That, that last portion of that text was out of Psalm chapter 2, where God the Father says to God the Son, Today I have begotten you. You are my son. This is sort of the mystery of the triune Godhead, where, where they work together. They fellowship within that in those three persons to accomplish our redemption. And God, did, he willed from eternity past that Christ be our high priest. That Christ be the one who is set aside to represent us in the holy place for God. Um, Christ, he took on flesh, right? He's truly God. He is truly man. In the incarnation, Jesus Christ became the one who was going to be the representation of mankind. It is the will of God that we come to him through Christ. Right. And Christ is a better high priest than Aaron. Yes. What does it say in verse 4? No man takes this honor to himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Aaron, as a priest, is a type and a shadow of Jesus. And Jesus is one that God has set aside to be a greater high priest than Aaron was. Um, our next chapter, I think, Mom, you might have this one as well, but it's Hebrews 4, uh -huh. verses 14 through 16. Right, okay. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we, as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The purpose of a high priest is to ensure that each of us has a place before God in the time that we need it the most. So as Aaron was taken from among the people, he understands what they're going through. So Jesus... He knows what it feels like. I'm not a person who believes that uh, Jesus was necessarily tempted with every single individual sin that every individual person ever felt, like awful things like pedophilia or substance abuse or something like that. But make no mistake, Jesus was tempted for 40 days in the wilderness. He was tempted with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Satan whispering into his ear, bow down, worship me, I'll give you everything. Turn these stones into bread. Satan tempted Christ, and Christ overcame that temptation for us as to where the first Adam fell whenever he was confronted with uh, a similar temptation. Jesus Christ overcame on our behalf. And um, I, I, don't, I don't know how... You have a, do you have a King James This one? is King James. I love how the KJV words it right there in... Uh, where, where is it? In... in Verse 15, my translation says, he knows, it says, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows what it feels like. 
in the darkest moments of temptation where you just feel it pulling you away from Christ, Jesus knows what that feels like. And I would even like to suggest um, that even when we give in to the temptation and that embarrassment, that shame, that guilt rests down upon us for our sin, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that he became sin. He cried out on the cross, Father, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knows what it feels like to bear sin and to be cut off from God because of it. And now that he is resurrected, that he's ascended, that he's sitting before God as our high priest, he ensures that, hey, these people are encompassed with infirmity, and I know what that's like. Father, have mercy. In their darkest times of temptation, in their darkest times of sin, we know that one is standing in front of God on our behalf to make sure that we will always have access. Amen. So God right. says in response, be bold and come to this throne. In the time that you need it, when do you need mercy? The time that you sin. When do you need grace? In the time that you're tempted. The times when you think you don't have access to God. That's the time whenever Jesus says, mm -hmm. I understand what that feels like. I'm your great high priest. Be bold. Come receive grace. Come find mercy. Jesus is our great high priest. That's when we have him the most. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and at any time, we're, we're in Bible study mode. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. We'll, we'll talk about it. If you have a comment, raise your hand. And we'll, we'll talk about it. I, I got one more talking about Christ, our high priest. Um, this last one is Hebrews 7, 25. I think it was back there. I think I have it. Oh, you have it? Okay, <laughs> my bad. Hence also he is able to save forever those uh, draw near to God through him since he also lives to make intercession for them. Yes. Just that one verse. Uh, go ahead and read 26 and 27. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above all the heavens. Who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people? Because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. So what do we find about Jesus, our high priest? It's not only that he is a better high priest than Adam, in that he was a sinless high priest, but also that he was a spotless sacrifice. Jesus was not only the priest who goes into the holy place on our behalf, he's also the offering. And so because of that, we have a secured place before God in him. Christ is the priest and the offering. He is able to save where the Levitical priesthood cannot. He is a sinless priest, a spotless sacrifice. Any doctrine that tells us that you can come to God without Christ as your priest is a false doctrine. That's strange fire. It, it won't work. Christ is the only one that God has ordained. Christ is the only sinless one to secure our place before God. Christ is the only spotless sacrifice who offered himself up once. So as to where the Levitical offering is offered up once a year and even daily uh, Christ was offered up once, and now he stands every year, every day, for us there to ensure that we have a place. My favorite hymn is uh, that hymn, Before the Throne. Has anyone heard that hymn? Okay, maybe not. You <laughs> should hear it. The first verse of that hymn says, Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. Christ not only our high priest, but Christ also our offering is seen in the next verse. So let's go back to Leviticus 16. In verses set, starting again in verse 7, it says, He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the scapegoat and the other lot uh, w one lot uh, for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him 
for a sin offering. So you got two goats here. One offering is to be a sin offering. The other goat is to be a scapegoat. And we're going to get to the scapegoat after that. But first I want to talk about this sin offering. There's two goats here, and Christ is the image that is only uh, foreshadowed through these two offerings. The first one is a sin offering. And I, I'd like to ask a question. Why does God have a sacrificial system? Why does there have to be blood shed for sin? Why can God not just simply out of the goodness of his own heart say, I forgive them. These people have broken my laws. These people have come against my ways. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and just because I'm a good God, I'm going to forgive their sin. No sacrifice necessary. Many false doctrines today. Did you have an answer? Because he's a just God. He's, a just, he's holy. That's right. He's holy. He's a just God. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely. Um, Justice. And, and that's what I, I'd like to get into for a moment. This first offering, uh, I, I believe that um, it's captured in the doctrine of propitiation. Propitiation is, is this first doctrine that is pictured in, in this first goat. Um, did, did you have Romans 3? Okay, yeah, go ahead and read that out. Read loud. Romans 3, 23 through 26. I'm not sir, this is sir. <laughs> Thank you. I want you to picture for a moment, um, just let's give the most crude example that we can of a murderer and a rapist, you know, and, and, and he commits this horrible crime against the person who's closest to you in your life. Just crude illustration, okay? This murdering rapist who commits a crime against the closest person to you. They catch him, he stands in a court before a judge, and you're in the courtroom. And this criminal says to the judge, Judge, I'm sorry. And he means it. You know, he's truly penitent. I will not do it again. Please forgive me. And the judge looks him in the face and says, Okay, I forgive you. You are free to go. I grant you pardon. Nothing else is necessary. You can go back into society. If you were sitting in that courtroom, you wouldn't accept it. There would be outrage in the streets. If our society is a good society, we would say that is not acceptable. And the greatest dilemma of the Christian faith that we really don't talk about very much anymore is the fact that if God is good, he cannot simply forgive. And this is the essence of substitutionary atonement. Right. If God is good, he cannot forgive without an atonement. Because that's justice. That's justice, right. A, a crime, an awful crime, as heinous as sin, must be punished. Yeah. And, and that's the reality. Many, many teachers would come out today and say, well, man is too good to be punished. Other teachers, such as universalists, would come out and say, God is too good to actually punish. But the reality is that God is so good that he cannot and will not let sin go unpunished. Mm -hmm. yeah, what does it say right there? Means, that, <laughs> exactly. That, that first verse, verse 23, says all have sinned. I, I, I would like to submit to us that the most terrifying contemplation for sinners to think about whenever we're thinking about God is his goodness. Because he is good, he is a judge. It's not necessarily that, oh, God is a judge. I'm so afraid of that. It's that, no, he is a good judge, and I am a wicked sinner. What does a good God do with a wicked person like me? How can God forgive and yet maintain his justice? Matthew, my, I, when I'm hearing that, I'm, I'm not, to not to make a too, too bad of a comparison, but if, if parents allowed their children to 
just continue to do <coughs> to do wrong right. or to or put them in put themselves in harm and they never corrected them that's a bad parent mm -hmm. right parents correct their children because they love their children they want them to be the best that they can be mm -hmm. yes that's why we ha that's why you have that correction yes and so let's look at this right here in Romans 3 it says in verse 25 whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness. So going down verse 26, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one which believes in Jesus. The cross is the demonstration of God's justice. God is the justifier of wicked man. And God is the just punisher of sinners. So God's wrath, God's hatred for sin, and sinners alike, is poured out in full on the cross. This is my justice. Do you want to see what a good God does whenever he is faced with sin? He pours out his wrath in full and crushes his own son on the cross. And at the exact same time, the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God is demonstrated in its fullest extent in that God himself is the one who chose to take the sin of mankind and bear every ounce of that wrath. You heard it read in, in, in Romans 8, 1. There's no, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. It's not just that there is no condemnation. There's none left for those who are in Christ. Every ounce of the wrath of God that is rightfully, uh, that, that should rightly be poured out upon you and I for our sin was poured out in full wow. upon Christ. Propitiation means the removal of wrath. It has to do with the offended party. Whenever we sin against God, God, has to demonstrate his justice before he can offer mercy. A propitiatory sacrifice makes forgiveness, mercy, available to us. So th there's one more verse that I want to look at with regards to this, and it's Romans 5, 8 through 9. That's, uh, I have that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Yeah. So when I ask you, whenever you accepted Christ, what were you saved from? It, well, in Matthew chapter one, it says that we're saved from sin, right? Matthew 1.21. In, in, in Luke chapter 1, it says we're saved from the hand of our enemies and all those who hate us. We're, we're saved from the demonic. We're saved from the devil. We're saved uh, from hell, right? Uh, that's not all. And this is the main point of our faith as Protestant evangelicals that doesn't get talked about enough whenever it comes to atonement. In the atonement, we are saved from God. The heart of the gospel is that God loves his enemies. That's you, and that is me. We sinned against God. God, because he's good, has wrath toward the wicked. But God demonstrates his love toward us. In that while we're sinners, at the time when he has every right to hate us and judge us to the severest extent and a hundred times more, he says, I love you so much that I will die for you. I will bear the wrath. I will bear the reproach. I will remove it from you, place it on myself so that you can be accepted before God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Praise the Lord. Christ was the propitiatory offering. Propitiation is the heart of the gospel. The substitutionary atonement is the heart of the gospel. It's a non-negotiable. Whoever says that you can come to God without a substitutionary sacrifice, and there are many, that's strange fire on God's altar. Mm -hmm. That's a false teaching in Christ's church. 
This is what makes us Christians, that Christ bore the wrath of God on our behalf. You know that hymn that I love that none of you have ever heard before? <laughs> the second verse of that hymn says, Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied. He's satisfied to look on him and to pardon me. Whenever we come to God and we ask for forgiveness, God doesn't just say, okay, I'll forgive. No, when, whenever you come to God and say, God, forgive me, God looks at the cross. He looks at the cross and he looks at the suffering of his son and then he listens to the cries of his son who stands before him as our high priest whose blood uh, speaks better things than the blood of Abel saying, forgive, forgive. I took the wrath. I took the punishment. Forgive. Then the Lord says that I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. It is enough. It's finished. I can forgive now. Praise God. There's one more offering. There's one more goat that is offered in Leviticus 16 on the Day of Atonement. And that is the scapegoat. The scapegoat. We're going to read verses 20 through 22 right now. It says, And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in all their sins putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And, and hear this, verse 22. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities into a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Propati propitiation is the removal of God's wrath. This goat signifies the doctrine of expiation. We have propitiation, the doctrine of expiation. Expiation has to do with what is coming between you and God in the first place. So it's not just the wrath of God, we're talking about sin itself. We're talking about guilt, what stands between us and separating us. Right here in this passage, the high priest is taking a goat. He kills the first one, okay? So that that blood can make forgiveness available, can make it just for God to be the justifier, so to speak. The second goat, he takes this goat, he takes all the sins of the people, puts his hand on that goat's head, and he confesses their sin over this goat. And this goat then bears their sin, and expiation takes place. Another guy takes that goat, and he sends it off into the wilderness. They remove it from the people so that not only does God forgive, he removes completely. He doesn't just forgive sin, he completely takes it off. He blots it out of your account. I have Psalm 103. Who had that verse? You had it right here? I don't know. I know one that'll fit that though. As far as the east is from the west. That's it. So far as he's he moved our transgressions from us. Yes, ma'am. And the one in front of that is that he loved about his love. I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah. Can you I don't do the know one before? Which one you want? I, don't, I can't see. <laughs> okay. That, that, that's what I was getting at. Yes, ma'am. It says, that's, as far as the, the east, east is, is from, the west. from the west, so has he removed our sin from us. I want you to understand east and west are not there. <laughs> positional standpoints, they're directions, right? So east means go that way and it never stops. West, Go this way, and it never stops. Okay? Sin is an eternally punishable crime. Christ is eternally worthy of our worship because when he removes our sin, it is eternally gone. It is lost in the sea of his forgetfulness. You are not just forgiven if you're in Christ. Your sin is eternally separated from you. Uh -huh. It's eternally removed. My last verse, this is our last one, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Who, who, who had that one? I guess I can just read it. 
You, people are supposed to get your verses. <laughs> <laughs> Not working. Okay. Second right. Corinthians what? Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty-one. Next time. This <laughs> getting <laughs> It says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Mm -hmm. Christ who knew no sin was made sin for us. This, this verse speaks of a double imputation. Imputation means what was on you, what was rightfully yours to claim, is placed on another. There's a double imputation that takes place here. Christ, the righteous one, me, the sinful one. All of my sin is placed upon Christ. And he doesn't just take it, he becomes it. And in return, this is what Christ does that the Levitical offering could never do. Christ offers in return his righteousness, and he places it upon me. That is the doctrine of imputed righteousness. Without imputed righteousness, you and I have no hope of ever seeing God in a place that we call heaven. Imputed righteousness, it, 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 it was a doctrine that was rediscovered in, in, in the Protestant Reformation. It's not that it was ever necessarily untrue, it was just invented. It was rediscovered. It was ancient truth that was lost in medieval Catholicism. Do you guys know who is the main Protestant reformer that that rediscovered this doctrine? Come on, folks. Martin Luther? Yes, ma'am. Ma Martin Luther. He'll get mad at you. you got to be careful. <laughs> Sorry. Do I sound mean right now? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Martin Luther was the one who rediscovered this doctrine of imputed righteousness. Um, you know, he, he was a Roman Catholic monk in the medieval Roman Catholic Church. And no matter what Martin Luther did, he could never find peace before God for his sins. Um, in those days, uh, self-flagellation was a normal thing. His conscience was so tormented that he would take a whip and just hit himself to punish himself until he would pass out. He would go into uh, their confessional booths, and he would be there for hours, hours, every day. Every sin he could possibly think of. To where the priests that would hear his confessions would say, just leave and come back when you actually have something that's worth confessing. I'm tired of hearing you right now. But he didn't have peace before God. Until uh, he, he was in a castle, a castle tower, and he was meditating on Romans chapter 1. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and salvation for all those who believe, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For it is, um, what, what does it say? For, for by it, uh, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And, and we like to think, when I believe upon Christ, I'm made righteous. But it's not me that is made righteous. When I put my faith in Christ, and you need to understand this, faith is the instrument. It's a channel through which we lay hold of a righteousness that is not our own. Faith is an instrument that lays hold of the righteousness of God, the actual righteousness of God, and it makes it mine. It clothes me. That is imputed righteousness. Christ becomes my sin, and when I am in him by faith, I become his righteousness. So when I stand before God, God is looking at the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Galatians, I, I would recommend that to anyone who hasn't read it. It's, it's not light reading. <laughs> it's it's kind of short. You know? it, does anyone know who John Wesley was? Mm -hmm. uh, John Wesley was born again whenever he heard a public reading of Martin Luther's commentary on Galatians. Um, there's a quote from that that I want to share with you right here. Martin Luther said... <coughs> We therefore do make this definition of a Christian. That a Christian is not he which hath no sin, or feeleth no sin, but he to whom God imputeth not his sin because of his faith in Christ. This doctrine bringeth strong consolation to afflicted consciences, 
in serious and inward terrors. <clears throat> Whenever we consider the true extent of how heinous, how wicked, how horrible, how punishable sin is, if you will just look at that, you're going to see a pit that is so dark, so bottomless, it's worse than hell itself. And that is why we have to look, lift our eyes, why we have to behold the finished work of Christ. That is our only comfort. That is our only hope before a holy God. And God himself did that for us. I want you to imagine that you're an ancient Israelite on the Day of Atonement, that you've committed a sin and your conscience is in terror. You cannot escape this guilt and the Day of Atonement comes and you watch that first goat be sacrificed by Aaron and you realize it's possible for me to receive forgiveness. It's possible for me to call God my God. And then you see that second goat get brought out and you still feel the weight like that sin is attached to you. And Aaron lays his hands on the head of that goat and those sins that you committed that you can't escape and get out of your mind. He confesses those sins upon that goat and then you watch him be taken off into the wilderness. Have any of you read, I, I, I'm throwing out all these book recommendations and you know, sermon stuff, but has anyone read Pilgrim's Progress? This is a more, yeah, this is a more popular one. So on top of Luther's commentary, on top of uh, all these other books, you need to read Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress talks about a man named Christian, and he's, he's got this big burden on his back. It's like a big, big backpack that's just weighing him down, and that represents his sin, right? And he hears an evangelist come to him, and he says, do you want to be free from that burden? Do you see that gate off in the distance? And he says, I, I can't see it. Can you, can you see a small light off in the distance? He says, I think so. Flee from the wrath to come. Go. Go to that gate. Go to that light. And so Christian, bearing this burden, he goes to this light. And whenever he gets there, he finds a hill. And on top of that hill is a cross. And at the sight of the cross, the burden falls off of his back. And it rolls down into an open grave. And from that place, an angel comes, gives him a new garment that is white, spotless, a righteousness that is not our own, and it gives him a seal, a piece of paper that says, you have a place in God's kingdom. That last verse of that hymn says, behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect, spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace. Christ is our high priest. Christ is the propitiatory sacrifice that removes the wrath of God from us. Christ is the expiatory goat that removes our sins and takes them to the wilderness so that they are never to be remembered against us again. Brothers, sisters, you have no need be weighed down under a burden of guilt whenever you have such an amazing, beautiful, worthy, and glorious high priest as the man Christ Jesus. Amen. He paid it all and he did it for you. He does not merely reign in heaven over you. He reigns there for you and for me. He's everything. When faith is placed in this man, Jesus Christ, he becomes the end of all of our affections. In the Westminster Catechism, the first question says, what is man's chief end? It is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. If your Christianity isn't about the glory of God, then you don't need God to accomplish that. But if you want to come to God through the means that he has prescribed, to make atonement and reconciliation, you have to come through Christ. And you have to come to Christ the way that God has set forth in his word. And when you get there, you live for the purpose that you're created. Right? The enjoyment of God. The pleasure of God. John Piper rewords that same uh, 
first question of the catechism. He says, God is most glorified in us whenever we are most satisfied in him. Um, since I've been home from Nepal, I have not taken communion um, since I've been home. And as I was, I was preparing this message and contemplating the atonement, um, every bit of, of this is about the grace, the mercy, the love of Christ that is shown in the finished work of the cross. And so if it's all right with everybody, we have about seven minutes left and I would like to take communion this, this, this evening. So over here we have the elements and as we take these elements, I'd like you to look to the cross. And whatever burden of sin you feel, whatever separation you feel between God, we're going to partake in that. I want you to look at this last verse, last verse in Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus 16, verse 34, it says, And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you. This is the, this is the day of atonement. To make an atonement for the sins of Israel and for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. Ever since the destruction of the temple, these sacrifices don't take place. For the last 2,000 years, this sacrifice on the Day of Atonement, these two goats have not been offered because Christ meant what he said whenever he prophesied that that temple was going to be destroyed. This was the shadow. When the image appeared in Christ, they stopped. If you want to be made right with God, you come through Christ because these sacrifices are about Christ. And Christ doesn't offer this once a year. He was offered once. And he says that we remember him through the elements whenever we partake of his blood, whenever we eat of his flesh. And so if you guys would, um, we're going to stop the recording right now. And uh, right over here, if you would stand up and let's all take some elements.